Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm going to lower my camera up. And this is my review of Psychopath Season 2, Episode 7. Once again, a lot to cover in this review. Okay, a lot happened in this episode. First off, kind of a minor scene most people would think, but I want to talk about it real quick. That scene with, with uh, Akane's grandmother, I think her name was like Aoi Tsunamori or something like that, in the hospital, okay? I have a theory on her. Now, most people would probably look at that scene and say, you know, it wasn't too important, but I actually disagree, and this is why. Okay, if you look at that scene really closely, you could probably see uh, one of her earrings is actually, and there's a few things here, not just this, but one of her earrings is actually glowing. Okay. The one that Akana can't see, and that's kind of a minor sign that I think there might be more to her than meets the eye, but also, I, uh, if you notice, when Akane went into the hospital, everyone was dead, okay? They were killed by the robots. But Akane's grandmother was perfectly fine. Suspicious, maybe. She was playing on some sort of, like, an iPad or something, and I suspect that she was actually purposely kill using those, that iPad head to kill use those robots to kill everyone else in the hospital. Not like most of the people were in the city where they didn't even know what they were really doing. I believe that she was purposely doing it, and that's why she's the only one left alive in there, okay? That's what I believe, anyways. That's my theory on her, and that would actually be a pretty wild plot twist if they actually went that route, okay? Now, another thing I want to talk about that isn't really answered in this episode, and... Seven... Only four episodes in the series left, so hopefully they answer it soon. Um, I want to talk about Kamui's followers, because we do learn a little bit more about Kamui's backstory, okay? How 15 years prior to the start of the series, I'm guessing that means 15 years prior to the start of the first season as well, he was in a plane crash with like a... He was one of 185 children in a plane crash, okay? And apparently he was the only survivor. Now this is... this part where it gets kind of vague because from what I could understand from it apparently like he got these followers this like certain number of followers which I don't think it's been confirmed yet exactly okay, exactly how many followers that he has but he has a certain number of followers and apparently they've been pretending to be grown up versions of those children using hollows okay here's the thing though First off, in order to do that, they would have each had to live, like, so many different lives. Because there was 185 of them, including Kamui. So that didn't really make much sense to me. In addition to that, how the hell would they have gotten jobs? Because we learned this all the way back in the first season of the series. That in this world, Sybil chooses your job and career. You have no right, legally, to choose what you're going to do for a living, okay? You don't. Sybil chooses that for you. So it's really kind of weird, and that was really kind of vague. If someone can clarify that for me in the comments, then please feel free to, if I, like, mistake something there, because that could very well happen. I'm human. I make mistakes. Okay? But that's kind of what I was getting out of that there. And, of course, but, of course, there is the backstory, which is very interesting. And, apparently, Kamui has a lot of followers, people who basically worship him as this, like, savior. Okay? He has a lot of people. And apparently a lot of them have been working really close with them. Like, the final scene in the episode basically showed Kamui, like, trading with some of them in this, it's like, weird location. It seemed like it's really close to where they're, they were actually at. Like, the in inspectors and enforcers and whatnot. So it makes me wonder if he has a lot of inside operatives. And if he's maybe using the same method w with like scanning other enfor in, uh, enforce or a scan uh, God. if he's using the same method to scan the eyeballs of inspectors to keep their psychopaths down okay or maybe using like crowds which you've also seen him use in order to keep their psychopaths down very interesting okay it makes me wonder if he's actually worked in there before as well okay now another thing that I've been wondering is why doesn't Sybil system just shut the fucking dominators off? Like, if Kamui and his subordinates are able to use dominators despite their psychopaths being cloudy, then why can't they just shut the dominators off? 
like, and I'm going to answer that question. I'm going to answer that my own question. I know exactly why. It's because they don't want to admit that the civil system has flaws. Okay, that is exactly right, 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 right there. Okay, they do not want to admit the civil system has flaws. Akane, who seems to be a pretty respected uh, inspector in the civil system, that old lady, she told that old lady, I forget what her name, that old lady's, na lady's name is, by the way, but basically the head of the civil system, she told her that the civil system has flaws, and she t told Akane to watch her mouth in a pretty, like, demanding manner, which tells me that they don't want to admit that the civil system has flaws, even though they have so many fucking glaring flaws. It's crazy. Oh my god. So, yeah, and that's exactly why. And, you know, some would say, well, why don't they just shut off, you know, seven of them and j leave just one operational? And again, that's because they that would still be them kind of subsequently admitting that the civil system has flaws, and they don't want to do fucking do that. So yeah, that's exactly why right, right that why right there. I answered my own question for me, and it's bullshit. It really is. Like, I really think that this head of supposed head of the civil system is going to turn out to be like a major antagonist, like a major villain. Because in the first season it was kind of building up to it, but she never they never really found out what her true intentions were. Neither did we, I don't think. I mean, we do know that she's part cybernetics at least. But we don't really know what her true intentions are, so if she actually turned out to be a major villain, that would explain a lot, okay? Um, and another thing, an, um, another thing I want to mention is something we learned in this episode, which differentiates Kamui from Shogo Makashima from the previous season, okay? Oh, by the way, I really wish, whenever that lady tries to say that Kamui's existence is impossible, I really want to say... I, or I really want uh, Akane Tsunomori to just pound on her desk and fucking tell her, what about fucking Shogo Makashima? Have you forgotten about her because, or him? Because apparently there are, after all, other characters in this, most of the characters in the series who've encountered him seem to remember him. I mean, if he killed my fucking best friend in the world, I'd probably remember him. Uh, you know, but no, she doesn't do that. Fuck. But anyways, though, the, what, differ, what differentiates Shogo Makashima from, from Kamui, and we've kind of went over this before, kind of, but not in too much detail. But what differentiates them is that Shogo Makashima could, could not be located on, on the uh, radar, okay? Or, I mean, he could, but if for some reason his psychopath would only go down. However, Kamui isn't even on the radar at all. And because of that, Sybil doesn't want to capture him. Sybil wants to completely fucking eradicate him. Okay, because his existence should not be possible due to the standards of the Sybil system. And again, if they were to capture him, that would be kind of be a form of them, a way for them to admit that the Sybil system has flaws. Okay, and that's obviously, as I keep saying in this review, something that they really don't want to do. Okay. So, yeah, they don't want to capture a Kamui. movie. They want to completely fuck fucking destroy him. And that's why that lady actually criticized, kind of, subtly, uh, Akane for not taking the shot at the end of the last episode when she had the chance. Believe it or not, she was actually criticized for that, even though she figured that was the right thing to do. That lady criticized her for it, asking her if stopping Togane was really the right thing to do. So, yeah, very interesting, okay? Very fascinating. And also, I really think that Akane is starting to go, go a little bit crazy now. And the reason I say this is because, like, she, like, there's always been signs of this. But now especially, mainly because, like... She's having hallucinations of her talking to uh, Kogami, okay, in this episode. In this, like, weird world filled with blue, I don't even know what the fuck you'd call it, okay, and basically in her mind. And when she snaps back to it, it she's right next to a Togane. And that could also mean that Togane will actually turn out to be Kogami because, like, let's face it, who does not want to fucking see... 
Kogami again. I think he was the second best character in the first season. First, of course, being Shogo Makashima. And obviously, Makash like I've said before, obviously Makashima's not returning. So, I mean, unless, uh, he's, uh, unless we can get some of those Disney animatronics in there, he's obviously not fucking returning. So, if we get Kogami back in here, then that'd be fucking amazing, okay, really. If he was done as much justice as he was in the first season, that is. Okay. <clears throat> and also, I just want to comment next on Kamui's supposed, like, worshippers. They seem rather strange because supposedly, okay, supposedly the whole reason they're worshipping and following Kamui like this is because they feel that he's going to set them free. Free to live normal, happy lives without fear of the Sybil system, no matter what they think, say, or do. Okay. However, one of them in this episode committed fucking suicide. Now, if you were planning on living a happy life later on, would you commit fucking suicide? I don't think so. That seems kind of like the opposite effect, you know? If you wanted to commit suicide, why wouldn't you just do it? You know what I mean? So it makes no fucking sense. However, I do have a solution to this. The drug that Kamui gives his subordinates. That drug might not, might not only convince them to work for him no matter what, but also when he's done with them, it might convince them to commit suicide. So that drug might be the key to the entire thing with, in terms of his worshippers. Everything, including his worshippers, might be tied directly to that drug. Okay, and I think that's very interest, very fascinating right there as well. Okay. We also do learn a little bit more about Togane's backstory, a bit of a minor thing in this episode where Togane used to be an enforcer and he got fired for some reason, which we don't know why. Um, and now he's an enforcer again. Again, I'm saying those Kogami vibes are fucking strong in here. They really are, and I can't complain because Kogami's fucking amazing. Yeah. Am I the only one who thinks that really, like, is there any one psychopath fan out there that doesn't like Kogami? <laughs> like, I've never met one, and I seriously hope that I never do, because that would be really awkward. <laughs> okay. So, anyways. Um, and Mika. Mika's still a piece of shit. Two things in this episode. Apparently, first off, not only did she sneak into Togane's room to steal some shit from him, but also... That, I forget what his name is, but that one, like, red-headed, shy, uh, uh, enforcer who's, like, really intelligent. He's, he's really fun to watch, by the way. He actually called, uh, Akane, uh, Big Sis in this episode, which, you know, I don't think she minded it too much because that's just the way she is. She doesn't look, she never really looked down on enforcers, Okay. And I think he's just really fun to watch. Apparently, he filed a report from, like, an last episode or the episode before or something like that. And he not only sent it to Mika's email, but he was planning in the last episode on giving it to her verbally. Or maybe it was the episode before that. I honestly don't remember for sure. And she stopped him from doing that. And then, in this episode, criticized him for not doing that. Are you fucking kidding me? That's like, that's like, I, I don't know what that's like. Like, oh my god, I cannot think of a proper comparison because that's just incompetence at, of, the high, of damn near the highest fucking order. You cannot tell me she's not going to turn out to be a great, a, like a vi major villain later on in the series. Like seriously. Either that or she's just really fucking stupid and I hope she dies. God damn it. So, anyways, overall, once again, there was a lot of stuff to talk about in this episode, okay? But it was really good as always. I think it was better than last episode, just simply because, first off, of the more foreshadowing, also plot, re like, uh, plot reveals and revelations, but also because those that, that questionable writing that I mentioned in my last week's episode review wasn't really here. Which is good, of course. I'm glad that it wasn't really here. Okay, I really am. So I did think it was better than last week's episode. It might actually be the best episode in the season two so far. Definitely nowhere near as good as for season one yet, but that's just part of the course, I think. 
because this isn't written at all by Gen Robucci. He has absolutely nothing to do with it. Really, I think that this series should have been scrapped, and what his plans are for the movie should have been made into a full 22-episode series. I'm being honest. That's what I really think. But nobody cares what I think. So anyways, so um, if you have yet to see this week's episode of Psychopath Season 2, then I definitely recommend that you do. Um, I cannot wait for next week's episode to air. This was really fucking good as always. So anyways, overall, I hope you enjoyed this review, guys. See you after, guys. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.